lot of people don't actually know how to get these tokens. They kind of walk in, the UPS has been set up, they don't know where to find this. So when you click on the three dot menu, next to a rule you have defined, it actually has a little box at the bottom that says about tokens and filters. And this will show you what token schoolbox recognizes. But then a question pops up of, well wait, what does that mean when connected to our sys? Our support team about two months ago actually went and put all of our UPS code up on Schoolbox Help. Meaning that you can now see what does that token link to in my sys. Now there's a couple of instances where this is a problem because we might use a stored procedure um, as I discovered with the school pro connector yesterday meaning that we can't tell you what we're getting. But what we get is something like this. So this is the synergetic, uh, what are we, synergetic student query. So we're able to see exactly what within synergetic those tokens are mapping to. That way, when the question pops up, okay, where is this information coming from? Especially when it comes to things like the student login details. That comes from the network login field within Synergetic, uh, which is attached to a user profile. If you go hunting, you'll find it. Number one question we get asked when schools first start setting up the UPS is where does this piece of information come from? So if you haven't already, having a look at that home page, as I said, all of this information is now sitting there because we want to make sure you can see where things are coming from and what is used. It's all right, um, I'm hoping these slides will be available. If not, I will go back to it. Um, there's also links in Schoolbox Help under UPS, so I'll throw it up at the end. So again, what is coming through for, I um, wish I remember which one this was, but I think this may be TAS student. This will tell you which tokens are actually in use. As you can see, not everything is in use. Not all tokens are available for all SIS providers. That can be due to that we don't have access to that data. The data may not actually exist within the sys. So it's helpful to know then which tokens can I use when I'm building my rules. If you go and use something that obviously we have no data for, the rule is going to be null and void. The second piece to tokens are filters. The reason we use filters is because Schoolbox is case sensitive, meaning that if you have inconsistent data in your sys, which is a problem probably 8 out of 10 times, you may need to filter that data as it comes through. A simple example of this is turning everything to either uppercase or lowercase. That way if you're saying your house codes are equal to G, even if it's a lower G or an upper G within your sys, it's coming through in the correct format so you can map it appropriately in Schoolbox. A lot of the times uh, you may not necessarily have your student email addresses, uh, sorry, your student usernames stored in your sys, but you will have their email addresses. So what you can do is you can actually break that into the pieces that you need and form their username in Schoolbox. <coughs> so that's where something like pre at comes into play. The reverse of that is you may not necessarily have their email address in your sys and you may need to form that. So you can actually add plain text after a particular token to form out that email address. So this may mean that you actually have their first name, dot last name as their email address. You can actually grab the token of first name, dot token of last name, and then write the at, you know, here is school.vic.edu.au and you can actually form that email address within Schoolbox. Meaning that you don't need to go and add the field or add the data into your sys, you can modify it within Schoolbox as it pulls through. This is one that a lot of people may not have seen. You can use tokens in combination. So if you were using a particular token or you don't necessarily have enough data within your sys, you can use two tokens to form the particular query. 
So what this means is I might want to be looking at my campus involvement, but I may need to do it based on what campus they exist in, in my CIS, but also what year level do they exist in. Because I might have grade fives that are in a different campus to the rest of my school. So here is an example where I've used both campus code and year level with a hyphen between them. What this does is if you have a look at my mapping, it says S10. It forms the combination of S being my campus code and 10 being the year level. And then I can map it to the particular campus. You might use this for house code and year level. If you have particular tutor groups that are in a particular format, you could do it for, um, what else is that? Boarding house and year level. Uh, for staff, you could use it for position code and department. It gives you ways of increasing the number of tokens that are available by joining and combining them. The other thing you can do is form a list. So when we're using either an if statement or when we want to do a matching, what we can do is we can actually just go and place all of the variables in a single list. What a lot of people will do is go and create 15 if statements for each of the values that they want to be looking at. So they'll go if year level equals one, if year level equals two, if year level equals three. Or they'll do a groups remove and group remove from year level one. Groups remove from year level two. The system will actually handle lists and be able to allow you to build and stack that data. So then how does this all tie into group management? Because that's obviously one of the things that most people ask the question of is, well, how do I use the UPS to manage my groups? When I sat down and spoke to people over the last few days, it, it's actually pretty simple in the way in which the system does this. So, I will say for those of you on Pro and Elite, because it doesn't work on basic, dynamic groups are really, really simple. They are remove everything from a group add everything to a group. If you're a group administrator from the group, you still are fine. You will still remain within that group. All other users will be removed. So what this means is if I want to set up my campus pages or even my year level pages, and at the end of the year, my year levels go obviously up one layer. So my year sevens are now in year eight. What this means is that when that takes place and this data changes in the sys, those users will be moved into that next page. So they'll be removed from the year seven page and added to the year eight one. It could be you might have tutor groups and a student may move tutor group for some reason. This would allow you to do that mapping and as soon as that data goes through in your sys, the next time the UPS runs, the student's gonna be moved. So using those combinations of tokens and the mapping rules, you can then go and build out these rules to support what it is or who you want added to these pages. If you want particular teachers to have right access to a group, the best recommendation is to make them as group administrators. What a lot of the time you'll see is people will put an if statement in and they'll put the teacher's external ID or their synergetic ID or their TAS ID in that list and give them right access. Meaning each night when this runs, it's going and giving them right access. If you use the group administrator, it will go and actually leave those people in place. Meaning you don't need to have those rules if you're using over and over again. It just makes life that little bit simpler. As I said, it's actually as simple as that for the group design. If you use those combinations, you use the pieces that are there, it's actually pretty simple. But it's why I kind of wanted to touch on this and touch on how to go about designing your UPS rules. 
A lot of the times what we find is that schools will often start off with quite rudimentary designs and over time they start to add more and more complexity. So, this is one problem that came up. Was I need staff members to be able to add it to the appropriate campus. I can't use campus codes because my campuses of Melbourne, Sydney and Canberra just have three codes. But each of my campuses actually have three sub-schools. Well, actually, two have three, one has two. And I need them to be split along each of those lines. The school uses synergetic, which means that you can't have multiple year levels associated with a user. So how do we go about building these rules to make sure that each person is in the right required location? So what we looked at is we have three tokens that we're going to go about using. We have the campus code, we have the meta position, and we have the year level. As I said, we can't use the year level. I wish we could because it would make our life really, really easy. So what we need to start thinking about doing is going, all right, the first thing I'm going to do is going to remove everyone from all campuses. Because what happens if a staff member gets moved to another campus? So one day they exist in Melbourne, the next day they're in Sydney. We need to be removing them from those campuses or else everything builds over time. So then what we want to do is we want to go and add everyone to that particular campus. So in this instance, we're going to add everyone to Melbourne. Because what happens if you're a teacher and don't have a year level? Or what happens if you're not a teacher or a staff member of the school? How do you get access to those particular areas of the system? So we go and add everyone. Then what we go and do is for anyone that does have a year level associated, we go and remove them from all three of those campuses. So what we've done is we've added everyone that didn't have a year level associated to all three campuses. We've then got, gone and removed everyone that did have a year level associated from the three. And then we go and add them to the ones they're supposed to be. So we go and add them to either the middle, junior, or senior, based on where they should be. So we get something like this. So this is go and remove everyone. Go and add everyone, so campus involvement maps to campus code. If you've got the campus code of M, I'm going to add you to the three Melbourne campuses. Then what I'm going to do is, if you're on the campus of Melbourne, and you have a year level, I'm going to go and remove you from those three campuses. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to map the data for year one, two, three, to be junior, four and five in this instance. And so I start to stack my rules, start off with the biggest grouping first, and work my way down, narrowing it down as I move along. This allows you to actually get down to, if the data exists, in different tokens, you can get down to four or five staff. You can do this same kind of mapping for groups as well. So problem two is a little bit different. So school runs parallel education in years three to seven. They don't have separate campus codes for it, they have one campus code for their entire school. So how do they go about splitting those students into middle years boys and middle years girls? When looking at the SIS, most SISs will have a gender and a year level. Two easy tokens, two things that are easily maintained. So student one, student two, as you can see, easy data that everyone has. So the first thing we want to be doing is we want to be removing users from all the groups. Because obviously these are group pages, we don't want 
it just to be stacking over time. We obviously want to add all males to the middle school boys, all females to the middle school girls. This time around, we have two options. We can use combined tokens. So we go and remove everyone, and then we can go and actually use a mapping to two tokens. In this instance, gender and year level. So if it's M3, there are middle school boys. F3, middle school girls, so on and so forth. So I can use two tokens to form the information I need to build a really, really simple rule. Option two, I can use a conditional statement. Meaning, if the gender is M, then go and do these things. And go and do those year level mappings. Either way will get me my end result. One of them will require me to have more rules than the other. So what I wanted to kind of show is there are multiple different ways of building out this workflow. When you look at the problem and you look at each of the tokens or the available data, it's looking at how do we get to that end result. Which takes us to this. How do I know if what I've done is right? If you've ever looked at the UPS logs, they're quite interesting. They take a long time to decipher. Uh, and I'll tell you now, even via uh, command line, they're very, very complicated. Uh, James is aware that he needs to do something about it, and I'm really, really hoping he does sometime soon, or else I'm going to lose my mind. But what I thought I'd show you is a couple of ways to helpfully understand what's taking place. So obviously the first thing is, this is what you get when you go to the UPS page. This is your logs. Obviously, when did it run? It used to be, it would always just say 10 o'clock, now it's whenever you did the last run. What roll type was affected? Is it a dry run? Meaning, it, is it the time where it's, you've attempted to do a dry run? It's gone and seen, would this work? Or would it fail over? Then you've got created, updated, and skipped. So the first thing when you're looking at this screen is if you hit view all logs and you see the same number of users created every single time your UPS is run, what that means is there's issues in your data. And it's most likely one of two things. There's no username, or the username is already in use, or there's no campus assigned to that particular user. When we look at the UPS log, it will have a statement that says user, uh, the user sanity check has failed. If it does get updated or skipped, that diary is actually normally pretty accurate. But the created one, if you see the same number pop up over and over again, you'll see that there's something wrong. So this is for a new user being created into the system. Every single UPS run is based on external ID, so based on the sys ID. So that top ID there of external user ID doesn't exist in the system. No, it doesn't. I'm going to go and do the UPS through all of this. It goes and looks at, all right, what would the rules be? And what data would I pull across? You can see here, as I look through, username would be blank use internal mail would be blank. But I know pretty quickly that the username is going to be a problem because it's a critical piece of information for the system. As you start to move along, you start to get things that look like this, which scare most people. What you want to be looking at is the new data. Ignoring the stuff in the top, but anytime you look at the words new data, what is going to be on that right-hand side? What page are they going to get access to? What year level are they in? One of the challenges is you start reading through and go, oh, okay, well, always remove here, add user access here. What do all these other numbers mean? The 
one that we concern ourselves with is the one that says new data. And if you look at that new data one and skim through it very quickly, you'll see, figure out, we'll see what's taking place. The second piece there, the user record fail sanity check, is the one you need to look for. If you ask anyone that uses the UPS quite a lot, as soon as they land on the UPS log, they hit control F and they look for fail sanity check or just fails. This tells you pretty quickly why didn't the user get created. As I said, normally it's because the username is either not there, already being used, or they have no campus associated. Those two things are critical to the system. The third is role. So if you have a role mapping and the user is not going to get put in a role, the system won't create the user. If you have a look on this screen, you'll see the number two, the word create. And if you actually look at a UPS log, these are hyperlinks. The other one is internal ID. And what they will do is they will actually filter this report to either that user's external ID, the creation, so would a user be created, would a user be skipped, or to the user's internal ID. So they look a little something like this. If you know there is one student that you are having problems with over and over again, Instead of having to scroll through the logs, what you may want to do is filter the logs to that one student. The quickest, easiest way of doing that is when you first get into UPS, the very top of the page, it will say external user ID. Click on that external user ID. And then what you only get is something like that top URL there. And it says, you know, this is our training instance, so training.schoolbox.cloud but it's the end part that's important. The filter equals this. Go and change that external user ID to whatever the, external, whatever the Synergetic or TAS ID is, and that will filter to that person's record. Most of the time you're looking at an individual user. You know that something is wrong with one person, that allows you to go through and look at that. If it's someone within Schoolbox and you've got their internal user ID, you can do that same filtering and skip to just that person's record. If you're looking at everyone that would have been created, you can actually look at the action of create and it will filter out the other 4,000 records and only show you the 40 that you've just created. Same as if you're looking at who you've skipped, you can filter down to those particular people and see why they were skipped because there may be reasons in your rules. So those four filters are really, really helpful in being able to narrow down the giant logs of uh, pretty much logs that will break a browser. On that note, if you use Google Chrome and the log doesn't load, switch to Firefox and it will load. Um, helpful little tip that uh, we found out one day. Something about the two browsers, Firefox just does it better. I didn't want to say anything about this at all, but I thought I would get in front of it before the question popped up. So, as of early last year, we introduced what we call custom views. And the reason why we did this was to fulfill and to support some issues within schools' databases, um, some issues with some of our SIS providers, and give the schools some flexibility. So examples of this is that the account login field may not necessarily sit where we thought it did. You might have a custom field that's been there for 10 years, sitting in a different location, and that's where the information sits. There's some people giggling in the room because they know that they're the reason I'm talking about it. If you're Synergetic Schools, or really any school that uses an assist that has inactive, inact uh, inactive, inactive, Synergetic especially, we don't see users until they are active within the students, staff, or parents. So that means for parents, even if they exist within community and they are future parents, we don't see them. So what schools have done is they've created a new view that allows us to see those parents. Those parents are now able to come into Schoolbox. 
Same as past students, same as past staff. The last one is if you use TAS and you have some interesting things with your parent accounts. Whether they be complex splits, whether it be the combined family accounts, there are some requirements on needing to use custom use. There is information available on Schoolbox Help on how this all works, but it comes with one major thing that sits behind it. We can't support you in setting up these views in your sys, and we're unable to troubleshoot what is taking place in your sys. The reason being is, A, we actually don't know how a lot of these sisters produce that information. And the business rules of every single school is different. The second is, we actually don't want access to that data. Your sisters have access to medical information that we don't want to actually access, and a whole lot of things we don't want to see. As a result of that, what we have done is documented this process and ways of testing it as best as we can, but when it comes to the actual cis side of things, unfortunately we can't help in that space. So, when it comes to UPS, there are obviously questions, and I'll ask the questions in a sec. But I'll always recommend if you are stuck to contact the support team. Uh, if you're here and you're stuck, go annoy them uh, across today and tomorrow. But also the UPS documentation is pretty strong. So if you head to homepage 624, you'll see everything that I've mentioned. Uh, those queries that map the data are also available through there. There is also information on the way that custom use work. So you can actually see how do those processes work. It's very, very, very extensively documented. There are some test pieces in there. The simple piece behind custom use is if the data matches what we're expecting to see, it should work. But if you are missing core data, it is going to break and it will most likely break your system. So, are there any questions while we're in the room? All right, I'll start from the right. All right, so the question was about deprovisioning in the UPS. <laughs> ah. All right, so there is, for a very long time, from our perspective, we haven't really wanted to move into that space. One of the reasons being is we know schools uh, actually have a lot of trouble with maintaining SIS data, um, and I will carefully say this, with particular parts of the school going and making people inactive accidentally. And what we haven't necessarily wanted to do is we haven't necessarily wanted that to flow through all of the systems. So that's why we kind of had the, we won't go and delete users from Schoolbox based on UPS data. It's always been a manual action, something you have to do. The fact that it pops up more and more in pretty much every conversation you've ever had with a school that's been using Schoolbox for a while, means that we probably need to look at something in that space. But there is a way of working around that problem space without doing a lot of work. So what you can do is, and I was actually explaining this um, before this session, is if you go and use a CSV and go and remove, uh, go and move everyone into a particular guest role, so that these are schools that obviously they migrate their students and parents um, and even staff into a guest role type. Go and move everyone into that location. Then run your UPS and it'll actually go and move them back if they're still active users. So it gives you the ability to go and move everyone that needs to be moved. And then when the UPS runs next, which is when you go and click live for UPS run, because you don't need to wait for 10 o'clock anymore, it will go and move those people that need to be moved back to where they came from. Because obviously the external ID is going to match, the username is going to match, so that should go through the process. Now, I found out about that yesterday <coughs> afternoon uh, at about 4.30 before I left. I haven't tested it yet. I've heard it from James. I'm hoping it works. But that's a way that a couple of our schools have used it. But automated, it's a challenge. 
Uh, user management API is the way that a lot of schools handle it. Um, because that way they can go and build processes around once excluded from the sys, go and remove them from Schoolbox. Remembering that if you want to make a user inactive in Schoolbox, it actually is deleting the user. The account enabled and disabled flag just means that it's about can they sign into the platform or not. Um, and then the hotly contested one by our dev team is do they receive notifications or not. They'll still exist across the entire system. So for most schools, they want to actually delete the user as part of that process, which is where a challenge lies. Correct. And that's yeah. And that's the the challenge about the account enabled, disabled, the delete, and sort of the way in which that all works. Sorry. Uh, we are we are we are a TAS school, so uh, and we have two companies in TAS, yep. uh, and we had this issue that uh, kind of one company was coming over the other company. Uh, we had to create a new instance of a school box for the second company to work. Okay, so with the new uh, custom view, we can basically bring both as the for the UPS side. But and at the same time, we are doing, for instance, timetable mapping and this sort of a stuff. Would it break? Do we have to create view for every single query that you are querying our database, or just kind of we need to create view per every you know, time? So the, we don't have the ability to map to uh, for the rest of the system to different locations or different merged data. Um, the custom views only work for the UPS, so the user provisioning side of things. What that means is if you do, uh, say for example, uh, user profile data, it will still always look in the same location for it. Uh, Taz, I don't know enough about the way that the companies work in that space um, to be able to answer any more specifically on that. Um, but certainly the custom views only work for the UPS. Everything maps to the traditional location. Alrighty, uh, it was this direction. Yeah, sorry, getting back onto the deprovisioning. Um, running deprovisioning once a year is not really um, acceptable for us because we have staff, students and parents who come and go during the year. On the assumption that a, an account that has been disabled, as distinct from deleted, doesn't receive notifications anymore, and that's the major issue for us, does it make sense to use the... UPS to disable all accounts every night and then re-enable the ones that it's going to provision? So, um, when looking at the way in which the account enabled disabled, um, I'm guessing it's synergetic school? Yeah, cool. So, as I was saying before, TAS schools are lucky, we see inactive users. For synergetic schools, we don't see inactive users. So, what a lot of schools do is they actually have a, micro, a, a deactivation process meaning that they shift them into a year 13 or they shift them into a particular aspect or a particular attribute. Now, if you don't want to do that, this is where you would need to look at something like a custom view that actually had inactive users in that view, similar to what happens with the future parents. Um, but the way the UPS is designed is as soon as a user in Synergetic is inactive, we don't actually see that external ID anymore. We don't see that user at all. Um, which means that we don't know that they sort of don't exist to us. So that's where the challenge sits in, in the synergetic space, is that inactive users are invisible to us. Um, hence, there needs to be either, they need to be included, and you need to find another way of uh, sort of filtering those processes, or a lot of schools do a two-step changeover um, to, to handle it. So one day they move them into particular uh, year level, and then the next day they actually go and deactivate the account. Cool. Awesome. Um, are there any plans for the UPS to include um, pastoral groups? So you could dynamically add users to interpastoral groups, teachers obviously, staff. Um, good question. It's a good feature suggestion. Um, <coughs> Yeah, look, I don't 
don't know on that space. Um, it's actually not something that I have ever actually been asked. Um, it certainly would be an interesting suggestion. The one that there would be a concern that is behind it is do you, being that pastoral groups provide visibility, um, you know, is automated access to that visibility record something you want to do or not? Obviously, the pastoral reports are built on SIS data, separate to that, that kind of linking. Um, I feel like it's probably on the help forums. If not, I think we should prop it. Matt Samuel saying yes, it is on the help forums. Cool. It's on the help forum, so I would recommend voting on that um, so that we can try and get it in there. What have you? Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not uh, we could put class codes in the UPS. So we're trying to create like a dance group and we want everyone who's in a dance class to be members of that group. Is that possible? So the class codes in a UPS, no, because it's not something that we look at. Now, the question would be, um, your, what CIS are you? Uh, Synergetic. Synergetic. So the two options in that space, one is for Synergetic schools, we don't just look at the academic file type, we actually look at the other file types associated. Um, so even in our demo data, we have an outdoor education class and a, uh, I can't remember what the other one is. So they are, what are similar to timetable classes in Synergetic? And we view them, they're not shown in the timetable, so they don't exist within our um, timetable definition, but there is that association that falls through. You have to build a class code and find out what falls through. Yeah. Now, if you wanted to have it so you're using the existing classes that are there, depending on the sort of class structure you've got, you could use sub pages, um, but if the class code is attached, you are effectively having a group there anyway. Because the difference between a group and a class is one has a code attached and is automated by the sys, the other is a manual group process. You're wanting an additional group to the class. Yeah, um, and the system doesn't allow you to have duplicate class codes, which is the problem. Um, yeah. yeah. There'd be a solution, I'd be curious to know what it is, but there would be a solution. Um. With the error, error stuff, it'd be good if we could just get a quick summary of what they were, rather than having to wait for it all to load and then f investigate. We don't have time to investigate what they are, so that could be something, a summary of the errors. But is there a way to use the UPS for things like the calendar and the timetable? So we've had to add 26 rules because the headmaster, he's senior campus involvement, but he wasn't seeing the junior events and all that sort of stuff. So can the UPS help with calendar and timetable? Um, when you say when you say timetable, as in duplicate timetables over different campuses. So we've got staff who work over two campuses. We've had to add heaps of rules to say go to this campus and all that sort of stuff. Whether I could just say show all timetable or show all calendar events. No, well the calendar events you can go and give someone uh, the calendar permissions, uh, which would give them access to the whole calendar, so the calendar moderator uh, for particular campuses. So yep. Yep. So it's one of the service permissions. In regards to the timetable involvement, because that is tied inherently to the campus that a user is involved in, um, you could use campus mapping to add them to the particular campuses. Yeah, that's what we've done with heaps. But that's what we've had to do, but there's just so many rules in there now for all the different teachers. And but that should, um, based on what is within your SIS, you should find a way of being able to simplify those, those rules. Yep. To make Synergetic's a fun one. Synergetic's a fun one. Yeah, so Synergetic, um, interestingly, a lot of schools will um, just have a single campus mode in Synergetic. Um, they'll run multiple timetables, but a single campus mode. Yeah. Um, Doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, what we find a lot of schools now do is they actually own separate campuses and attach the, the timetable to each of the campuses. So they're actually separate definitions and structures. Yep. From a school bus perspective, if you had a way of being able to split them, through the use of one of the other tokens, whether it be uh, metaposition, metacategory type, some other field that's within there, you could then use that to do the split. Uh, that way you can do a mapping rule to simplify the process. Yep, cool. Thanks. Did you have a question? Yeah. 
given that um, we pay school box per student license, and given that I now have five years worth of students that haven't been deleted from school box, um, does that mean that at one point you might jump in and go, hey, how come you have 1,500 students when you've only declared 805? Yeah. I can't believe you did that to us. You've been ripping us off for this long. <laughs> well, to be fair, they're not actually students. So, look, that, that rollover process at the end of the year is an interesting one. Um, how schools migrate and what they do with existing users is always the question. As I said before, a lot of schools will go through the process at the end of the year of moving, uh, if they want to retain their students in the platform, They'll move their students into an alumni role. The alumni role is normally against the guest type, uh, so it's normally a, you know something where they only get access to what you want to give them access to. From that perspective, you're not like from a licensing perspective, they're not actually students from the system's perspective. Okay, so as long as we move them out of the student definition, then you wouldn't jump in and go, wait. Probably because they're no Sweet. longer attached to your sis. Um, and that, that's the big thing, it's because the UPS isn't managing them, they're not attached to the SIS, they are distinct individuals in the system. Um, so that would probably be, you know... So would you recommend to all the other admins here that we actually clean out the student pool every now and then in case you want to go hunting for license? <laughs> People who are scamming licenses or something? Look, I, I can tell you now, we, we have the data already, but we're not obviously, you know, we're not going to hunt you down and go, oh, look, you've got two students more than you said. That's not something that we're going to do. Um, but we do recommend you clean your data just because of actually ease of use. Uh, it's going to get easier as you try and clean your data up more and more. One thing that people often are uh, concerned about is what happens when they delete a user. Uh, the data is obviously still existent within the platform. Uh, it's soft deleted, meaning the user can be recovered. So it can be undeleted with associated information. Most schools now, they move them into an alumni or a past students or something like that. That way the students get access to the platform, they get access to their records to handle their needs the school, instead of just being a hard pass and now, you know, dead to us. Um, we don't know about the end of it. They do that, we say it's next. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify with your comment earlier about moving the role type to a guest um, as part of disabling. We recently discovered that when we do that uh, and they're no longer there as a student type, that means we lose access to archived pastoral data, which we need to retain, obviously, for seven years and recently had a situation where we needed to access the records from a student from a year or two past. I'm just wondering how to get around that or if there's yeah, any advice. Um Learn something new every day. Uh, the data is obviously still existing within the database itself. Uh, what it is is we're dropping the association that the student is a student in the system. So the same as um, things like the, the due work page and stuff like that changes for a guest role side. As I said, the information does exist in the system, uh, meaning that from a database perspective, it's easy to go back and get. Um, I probably will actually ask James a question about should that guest role type have partial records. Now, it does raise some complications, being that, for example, the staff role type and the parent role type don't have partial records associated. Um, it may be that the simpler solution for that is to move them back into a, that into a student role. The records should reappear because they're not actually deleted. It's just the linkage between that user profile and that user profile's partial records. Then move them back when you're done. So you're suggesting we would move them back at point of need should it ever come back? And yeah. That, ultimately leave them as guests. Yeah, that, that would be, um, it should. Uh, obviously, we'd have to test to, to know for certain. But by moving them back into the student role, the association between their profile, the partial care button, and the records should actually reappear because nothing is deleted in that space. Uh, probably the last question. Uh, regarding the UPS uh, conditions, if we put two ifs, I guess they work as and, right? Yeah, oh. so we'll go, uh, you know, if campus equals this and something equals this, <coughs> then do this. How do, how do we go about uh, having an or condition? Um, you can't. So two um, new, two so conditions. You, could, you couldn't use two tokens separately for the or. Um, you could do uh, if campus is this or this just by doing that list. Yep. Um, but if you had to use two tokens, you would actually have to use probably either a combination 
or two um, actual walls. Okay. Um, my question is piggybacking on the class code query with UPS. I know you guys have something called parents to class code script that you run for us, um, and that's kind of on a request that we can make through our ticket system. Do you have any plan on integrating that within the UPS so we can manage that on our own kind of capacity? Um, yeah, it, it's the you know parents to class, parents to group, the conversation pops up. It's something that we... It's been an interesting conversation. We've had it a few times in the last few months. For schools that want it run regularly, what we have said is we can probably set it up via the server to run on a regular basis. Getting schools to do it via the front end, because it isn't necessarily the greatest tool, um, it does require someone to have set it up in a particular way from a back end perspective. At the moment, probably not. Moving forward, the ability to easily add parents to class pages or parents to group pages <coughs> is actually a pretty important feature request. Whether it be that tool that does it or there being other mechanisms, I think definitely should be something we do. Okay. Thank you.